hello, welcome. Um, and it's great that you've all um, joined us today. My name is Paul Klenner, and I'm um, your look of Feel Better facilitator for today's session. So, and on behalf of Look Good Feel Better, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Q&A that we are very privileged to have Victoria Thompson join us, and I'll be introducing Victoria shortly. The welcome to those of you who are first time. It's great that you've um, logged on, but also for those of you who are returning and coming back for another class, um, it's great to have you all with us. I just want to remind those that are on for the first time that you can come and join these classes every month. There's no one-off or anything with these kind of classes. We hope that today's class will provide you information that um, you'll find useful for your treatment, either for you, for um, a partner, or a family member, or even a friend in the area of bowel cancer. Um, it's really useful um, getting on board and understanding uh, what bowel cancer is all about. So a little bit about Look Good Feel Better. For those who don't know about Look Good Feel Better, it's a product neutral um, organisation. It's a non-medical organisation. Uh, we do have though qualified speakers like Victoria come and join us and, and cover off in areas that we don't have those expertise within Look Good Feel Better. Look Good Feel Better uh, along with your online classes, um, also have face-to-face -face classes to help men and women with appearance-related side effects of, of all sorts of cancer treatments, including our physical changes to our skin, um, our hair management, um, our stress and our mind support um, through our times of treatment and, and also, I guess, out the other end where we're recovering. And as you know, looking good and feeling better can help you physically and emotionally um, moving forward to enjoy as much of life as we're able to, depending where we're at. And we reach women and men and teens that are affected by cancer, um, helping them to maybe manage a little bit with some more confidence and control. So this is a unique opportunity. Um, sometimes we don't get the opportunity to talk to someone with the expertise or it works amongst um, people with the, the different cancers. So do make the most of Victoria's um, opportunity today. So Victoria, so Victoria Thompson is a, a registered nurse and she's got lots of experience within the bowel cancer um, world in New Zealand. Um, she's frequently um, asked about treatment questions and support services available to people with bowel cancer throughout New Zealand. So she's a wealth of information. She's got extensive background in um, community and palliative care. And she loves helping others through nursing, support, education and advice. So today's an educational for her. So I'm looking forward to that. And Victoria says, if you've been diagnosed with bowel cancer, or someone you love has, don't be afraid to reach out for support. And I, and I fully support that. It's really, really important. And she can point you in the right direction and help you figure out all that confusing bowel cancer terminology that affects the different treatments. So with that, Victoria, welcome. The, the floor is yours. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much and kia ora koutou. Um, I'll apologise now if you see a black beast jumping up and down, it's my dog who's decided that she needs to join in this conversation as well. So I'll apologise on her behalf. Um, she's usually fairly quiet, but she might just spring backwards and forwards if you see her in the background. I'll apologise. Um, thank you very much for giving up a little bit of time on your Sunday to come and learn a little bit. So the way this will work is I'll, I've got a quick, quick, presentation uh, with a little bit of information, a little bit about where bowel cancer sits in New Zealand at the moment. There is some information there on treatment. It is all New Zealand based. Um, and then we'll look at a few other bits and pieces that tend to crop up quite a lot. Um, as Paul mentioned, please ask questions as we're going along. Otherwise, just jot them down. There'll be plenty of time at the end to ask those questions when we're finished. So um, without further ado, I will start, I will share my screen. Okay, if everyone can have their fingers crossed and let's make sure this actually works, okay? 
Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Well, welcome along. Let's make sure all of these actually are going to work now. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Love it when a good thing works. So just some really quick stats and facts and things like that. So um, mo the most recent numbers have us sitting at around about 3,400 people being diagnosed in New Zealand with bowel cancer every year. It's a reasonable amount. Um, and I suppose the biggest statistic, though, is that it is actually affecting around 1,300 people that will actually die from it. Now, putting that into perspective, the number of deaths per year from bowel cancer is around about equivalent to the number of deaths of prostate and breast if you combine those. So it's actually quite a large number <clears throat> when you look at it from that perspective. I realise that there's more people diagnosed with breast cancer and prostate cancer, but um, their longevity is much better than those who are diagnosed with bowel cancer. About one in 10 people nowadays in New Zealand uh, will be under 50 years old. So that's a growing statistic worldwide. Māori and Pacifica are often diagnosed at a younger age and a much more advanced stage and within the emergency uh, system uh, rather than any of the other systems that we've got out there. And currently New Zealand, as of June last year, so we're coming up to bang on a year now, uh, the National Screening Programme for Bowel Cancer has now officially been rolled out throughout Aotearoa New Zealand for those aged 60 to 74. So that's kind of where we're sitting at the moment. We're fortunate that we have a bowel cancer registry that runs across Australia and New Zealand. And I suppose the good thing about it in one way is that um, our figures per head of population are incredibly similar. So the average age is still around about 68 years old for diagnosis. There are slightly more men than women diagnosed every year. And most people are diagnosed at those much earlier stages, which is really good, really, really good to know um, that people are being caught and it is being caught in those early stages of bowel cancer. So some of the things to keep an eye out for, symptoms that take us to the doctor. Uh, when we recently ran a symptom analysis kind of checklist for people, this is what took them. And number one is changes to their bowel habits. And this is where it's incredibly important to know what's usual and what's normal for you. So whereas you might be normal going once a day, regular as clockwork, as soon as you've had your coffee in the morning, off you go. Once, if that changes and stays changed for any length of time, it's probably a good idea to have a bit of a chat with your GP about it. But it also is things like whether it's more or less frequent. Um, it's also things like shape, smell, um, and sometimes that feeling like you kind of want to go, but nothing comes out and it's, it's, it kind of goes on and on. Abdominal pain, the general fatigue that doesn't resolve when you have a bit of a rest. Um, so it's kind of feeling tired just all the time. And I know a lot of us can put that down to being exceptionally busy. Um, and it just seems to be busier this year than it has any other year. So, you know, we can put a lot of these things down to something else. One of the ones we do put down to something else, probably the most frequently, is bleeding from the bottom. It's often put down to hemorrhoids or constipation or something else. Or we just don't actually notice because we don't look. Um, now, I'm not suggesting you have to look every single time you go and use your bowels, but it is a good idea to have a quick check every now and then just to kind of keep an eye on things and see what you are actually flushing down the toilet. It could save your life. So Victoria, just, just on that one, if you're, you know, you obviously um, got to look down into the water, are you looking at something that's kind of red or is it dark and black in terms of blood in the, in the feces? What, what is it? Or is it any of that? <laughs> That's correct. Uh, it's any of that. Um, wow. So, unfortunately, it's not. Eat we're not eating. Hopefully, most of us aren't eating at the moment. So, it depends whereabouts you might have a polyp or a tumor actually growing. The further back in your bowel it is, so the more towards kind of where your appendix is on that right bottom side 
you're more likely to get something that's like old looking blood because right. it's had much more time to actually pass through. The closer it is to the actual opening, the more red it's going to be. So um, it just depends a little bit. Sometimes with the older blood, it's the smell that you might notice that's the difference first up. It will smell different. Um, right. But it is both. And it's not just in the bowl that you're looking. It's also on on the actual paper that we need to be looking as well. Okay. So sometimes age can make a bit of a difference for, um, you know, that whole picture of being diagnosed. Um, a lot of young people that I speak to, they say, well, look, I didn't really have any symptoms, or at least I didn't think I had any symptoms at the time. Um, you know, a lot of the time it might just be a gut feeling that something's not right, or it's an accidental finding. I was talking to one young lady and she was actually having um, an MRI on her shoulder believe it or not, and they noticed something in her lung at the time. And when they did all the tracing back, actually, she had a primary of bowel cancer with a secondary in her lung, which is actually what was giving her some of the shoulder issues. I know, go figure. For oh. those that are kind of in that slightly um, older, more mature age bracket, um, oftentimes the first uh, symptom or the first thing that we know anything about is when we return a positive fit result. So those are the little kits that are sent out to you every couple of years from the National Screening Programme. Um, I will talk a little bit about the National Screening Programme because it does run separate uh, to our charity. So sometimes there can be some differences depending on what your age actually is. So what is bowel cancer? Really quickly, um, it generally starts as a non-cancerous growth, like a polyp. Um, I do have the slide next. If any of you don't want to see it, I'll remind you to close your eyes, where I just show you what the polyps can actually look like in real life. Um, there's a specific type of polyp. If it's left untreated, it can develop into cancer. Um, and it will generally take anywhere between five and 10 years for polyps to change and for a tumor to grow. So generally speaking, they're quite slow growing. In our younger cohort, so those 50 and under, uh, sometimes that's actually sort of between two and five years that things can change. And it, it's just we don't entirely know why some of it could be, you know, a little bit around hormones and things like that and all those other good things that happen. So what do they look like? Like I say, if you don't want to look, that's absolutely fine. You might just want to look away for a moment now. So at the top there, you've got a beautiful, nice, normal colon. It's pink, it's moist, it's got good blood supply. Uh, it's got a few undulations in there, which it should have uh, just to increase the surface area of it. Next to that, you've got what we call a sessile polyp. They're quite flat to the skin, quite flat to the kind of surface of the bowel. They're a little bit like, if any of you remember back to your teenage years when you got a pimple, they're a little bit kind of like that and that they're that sort of rounded shape. Underneath that, you've got what we call a pedunculated polyp. Pedunculated is just a pretty cool word, really. Um, and they look kind of a bit like mushrooms. So they're on a stalk and they come down. They can grow to be quite big, a couple of centimetres big. Um, and they can grow down or up, a bit like stalactites and stalagmites within cave systems and things like that. And they can grow anywhere along the bowel. And then that last picture there is of an actual tumour that's growing. Um, you can see that the bowel colour has kind of changed a little bit. Um, and the tumours can look a little bit like a head of cauliflower. For those of you that like mushrooms and cauliflower, I do apologise. Um, but that's kind of what they can look like. Um, they often have a really good blood supply. And you can imagine as they get a little bit bigger, when things are trying to get through the much narrower gap, that's what's going to cause the irritation and what can cause the pain and the bleeding.
some of the risk factors, there's always risk factors associated with any of the cancers and with any of the long term diseases. So some of them we can do something about, some of them we can't. Unfortunately, we can't change our age and we can't change our family history. Um, what we can change is some of our environmental risks, such as diet, exercise, smoking, alcohol intake and those kinds of things. There's also some genetic risks, um, particularly a syndrome called Lynch syndrome, which tends to be the most uh, common of all the genetic ones. Uh, Lynch syndrome is a group though that covers cancers from um, the entire GI tract. So kind of, you know, esophageal, some of, some of the stomach, uh, bowel, uh, a lot of the pelvic cancers as well can also be related to Lynch syndrome, as can some skin cancers and brain cancers. So it's a syndrome that covers a multitude of different cancers, not just bowel, but it is the most um, common as far as bowel cancer genetics kind of go. Inflammatory bowel conditions will always increase your risk as well because an inflamed and irritated bowel is more likely to kind of develop uh, polyps which may then become cancerous uh, as, you know, kind of your bowel is already uh, not happy. So, Victoria, just on the, on the polyps, just so I understand, you were saying that, that from the origin of a polyp starting to grow through to when it might become cancerous is quite slow is, is that what is that what you yes <clears throat> they yeah. they're the assumption is that a lot of people might start growing them 10 years before they actually start giving you any symptoms or actually start causing any major issues polyps um can be a little bit quicker than that as you can imagine they're more likely right. to grow a little bit quicker but for that tumor to develop it can take quite some time you'll often hear people saying oh the doctors said to me look i could have had this thing for 10 years um and that's exactly right. why because they are quite slow growing so the only so is, is a polyp one of those silent things like a lot of cancers are that just kind of starts developing and the only way you might know is if it kind of ends up starting to bleed or so is a colonoscopy something that's the only way to find that you have polyps or not is, would that pretty be? much <laughs> pretty much um yeah. unless they're bleeding um yeah right yeah. Generally, generally speaking the only way to find out if you've got them growing along your bowel is to have a colonoscopy um yeah, okay. it's just one of those things. We don't know what's going on there unless we kind of have a good squizzy with a camera. Right. So the colonoscopy, how far does the co a colonoscopy go up through the bowel to give assurance to the person that they've kind of had a good viewing, so to speak? Um, it goes right the way. So it um, okay. goes in the in the anal opening. It follows the um, colon all the way up the left side, right the way across to the right, and then all the way down, pretty much to the juncture where your sort of small bowel, the very end of your small intestine, joins up, and okay. where your appendix kind of pokes out if you've still got one. So it goes right the way along the bowel. So generally speaking, nothing's going to be missed. If you talk, right. the other thing that you may get is a, um, a sigmoidoscopy. Now those, um, generally speaking, only do that very first part of the bowel. So they will only go from the opening pretty much up to the first uh, corner as it were, of your bowel, okay. which sits a little bit under your kind of your left hand ribs. Um, right. So it goes, it just goes that far and just checks out that bit. Is, is that, is there a particular part of the bowel where they frequent more? The polyps hmm. or? Uh, sort of yes, sort of no. It's a little bit dependent on age. Um, okay. there seems to be more, uh, rectal and anal cancers in our 
slightly younger cohort as well as on the right side, um, whereas in our sort of 60s and over, it tends to be reasonably well spread, you know, kind of along the colon. Um, but certainly for our younger, it tends to be sort of either in that sigmoid kind of area, which is on the left side or on the, you right. know, on those right sided tumours. And it, yeah, it, it is slightly age dependent. Okay. Is there anyone else got any questions about any of this at this stage? Yeah, Feel I've free just to hold your space bar down. Sorry, I've got one question. Is there any particular reason, Victoria, why the screening stops at age 74? Oh, can we get to that in a moment when I get to screening, which I think sure, is one of my sure. next slides. <laughs> and I will answer that question for you when I do that. Is that okay? That's fine. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. It might not be the best answer, but I'll give you I'll give you the good one that I've got. Okay. Um so uh, the reason these people are, are caught mid-air is that in amongst bowel cancer, there actually is some incredibly good news in that if it's caught early, it's well over 90% treatable. It's one of the most treatable cancers that we actually have. So caught in those really kind of, if you've just got a polyp that's just about to turn, so a precancerous one, or if you catch it at stage one and two, you've got an incredibly um, good chance of coming out of that uh, with your life intact, uh, some surgery, and that's pretty much that's pretty much it. So it is a very, very treatable and beatable cancer caught early. So what I might do, um, since we had a question about screening, I'm just going to be really naughty, <laughs> and hopefully I've got. Should I leave them in here? Okay. So screening. I'll just quickly go back to it for um, the lovely gentleman that asked. So screening in New Zealand is available for um, ages 60 to 74. There's a slow rollout for Māori and Pacifica to start at 50, and that is to kind of um, bridge that inequity gap where they are developing cancer much earlier. Now, 60 to 74 is on the older side internationally. Most countries have 50, but they do stop at 74. Now, I don't have a really, really good reason, um, except that after the age of kind of 75, your risk of developing cancer, because bowel cancer in particular is so slow growing, your risk tends to kind of decrease with age. If you haven't got it by the time you're kind of in your mid 70s, then your risk of getting it is um, kind of lower. Uh, or if you do get it, uh, the chances of it being a life threatening or life limiting are much less. So as with all screening, we've seen it with breast screening, we've seen it with cervical you know, <coughs> They have age limits on it purely and simply because, for the most part, New Zealand's health system wouldn't cope if we did it for absolutely everybody. Admittedly, with my hat, my advocacy hat on, we want to see it available to everybody, regardless of age. Unfortunately, we have a workforce issue that doesn't allow us to do that at the moment. So I'm very sorry for whoever asked the question. It's not a brilliant answer, but worldwide, um, all screening tends to stop in that kind of mid to late 70s age range, um, purely and simply because your risks, although you might develop a cancer, the risk of it being uh, life limiting are much less than if you get it younger. I'm sorry, that may or may not answer your question well. Um, I hope it just answers it a little bit, though. Yeah, no, that was, that was good, Victoria. Thank you for that. I guess, I mean, I was diagnosed, I, I turned 65 at the end of last year. And <clears throat> I was actually diagnosed in, um, oh, back in April. And I guess, you know, the, the obvious thing is I start to do the calculations and sort of go, well, this may have been developing since I was 55 or 60, you know, that sort of 
pre pre 60 years of age thing so mm. understand your rationale for it I think it's like most of the health system it's under pressure huh so yeah. um I'm just, just I guess I'm very grateful for the fact that they picked it up at all Do, can I just ask and you don't you don't have to answer mm -hmm. <laughs> um yes. was yours picked up as part of the screening or just as an yeah, incidental yes it, yes it was actually it was it was quite uh for, fortuitous in the sense that I actually relocated to Wanganui and a bit of follow up on uh, where my kit was and um you know it showed up within a couple of weeks and hey presto so yeah, yeah it, it was it was it was a good thing oh wow amazing it's been a bit windy down here in Wanganui today hasn't it my goodness it sure has <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm very pleased that the um screening was such a good it is actually a really good tool that we've got it's a tool mm. that we have and I think it does really well for what it is yeah so as far as treatment for bowel cancer in New Zealand goes um now I realize that throughout the world everybody has kind of different ways that they uh different medications that they can treat with um and slightly different ways of doing things and even hospital to hospital it can be a little bit different in New Zealand so this is just a general snapshot of how we treat bowel cancer in New Zealand so our options as they are pretty much for anything surgery radiation chemotherapy um and the newer immune or targeted therapies. And it just depends what kind of stage your cancer's caught at, um, what the potential outcomes are, and you know, kind of what is the, the care rationale and ceiling that we're actually looking at. So for early stage bowel cancer, generally speaking, it is surgery, um, relatively quote unquote minor surgery for very early stage. Uh, where they take the tumour out, a couple of surrounding lymph nodes, a little bit of surrounding tissue, and um, then generally speaking, as long as everything is clear and they have good margins, you are quote unquote cured. For some of the late stage two um, bowel cancers, they may offer um, chemotherapy afterwards as what they call mop-up. Um, just in case they, they fear that there might be some circulating cancer cells that they want to get rid of. Um, so it just depends a little bit. Uh, it doesn't happen everywhere. Um, it will depend a little bit on, you know, kind of what the margins were and what they found when they did the surgery. For metastatic, when it has gone to other organs, so for bowel cancer, that tends to be the peritoneum or that kind of abdominal area. Um, liver and lung are the most common places for bowel cancer to um, metastasize to. This is generally needing a very thorough MDT, so a multidisciplinary um, approach, um, and will usually involve a mixture of, uh, you know, the, the procedures that are available. Um, depending on mutations and biomarkers that they might find within the tumors will, will let them know whether or not any of these newer immune and targeted therapies are going to be advantageous uh, or whether actually the normal funded medications are going to be the best option. So these are the drugs currently funded in New Zealand for bowel cancer and I'm sorry because I'm not an oncology nurse my pronunciation of any of them is a appalling um, and I'm so pleased they have names like Folfox because I can say that or Fol Fury I can say that one too. Um, they do have side effects as does any chemotherapy um, and there are different combinations of all of them that they can put together or the standard 5-FU or capsidopine they can do um, on their own depending on what kind of background you have. Um, think it's the oxyplatin that they don't tend to give people where there's been heart conditions um so yeah it just depends kind of what's going on as to which one you'll be offered and the kind of tumor that you've got and where it is as to which ones are offered as well victoria um just a question on so post-surgery or post-treatment what are the follow-up testing or, or what's the regime to you know track the fact that has it have you got it all um has any of it come back and that sort of thing you know again, of course that's over a period of time but are, are there blood tests are there things that that can be done or is it a 
is it another colonoscopy to have a look or what you know because different cancers you can actually test like you know prostate you can do blood tests right if your PSA is rising again those sorts of things but is it what is that for bowel cancer um there are I mean there are set testing regimes that they do um kind of post-treatment um okay there are, you know, MRIs, CT scans, um, colonoscopies, um, blood tests. Right. What they find with bowel cancer is that at the moment, there isn't a specific test that will say, yes, you've got bowel cancer or not. Um, CEA, which some people will have heard of, which is one of the cancer markers, it's an inflammatory marker. Um, I've got a lady that comes to our coffee group. She had a, a stage four bowel cancer and her CEAs remained absolutely normal right the way through. So right the way from um, diagnosis all the way through treatment, right the way out the other end, her CEA hasn't changed. So it's not the most reliable one for bowel cancer, whereas it can be for some of the others. And as you mentioned, for things like prostate, there's your PSAs and things like that that you can look yeah. for. Um, generally speaking, most people post surgery about a year later will have a follow up colonoscopy, give or take around about 12 months post um, surgery, depending on what type of tumour they found and depending on whether or not there was a lot of associated polyps or not as well. Um, right. And then there's regular, you know, kind of screening and testing and things like that done as there are for any of the cancers. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the common side effects for chemotherapy, pretty similar to most of the others. Um, the big one probably, well, one of the ones with bowel cancer, of course, if you're having chemotherapy um, straight after surgery or even just prior to surgery, one of the biggest things is you'll go from constipation to diarrhea almost on the you know, flip of a coin. Um, and it's being able to kind of, keep on top of that. Uh, the neuropathy in hands and feet where people get, you know, burning um, pins and needles. Some lady describes it as she feels like she's got really tight socks on all the time. Um, and it's a very odd kind of sensation. Um, the nausea, the vomiting, the fatigue um, that can go with chemotherapy. Um, and the other one that tends to strike a lot of um, patients is this un inability to tolerate cold. And that can be touching cold. And that's that's even just cutlery. Um, so you'll often see them, you know, with, with gloves and scarves and hats and things like that on, even when it's actually still quite warm. Um, you know, a cool breeze can kind of set throats off and make it difficult for people to swallow. Uh, you know, drinking cold water can also do the same thing. So, you know, there's often times people will, will only be able to tolerate warm. Um, they need to warm up their cutlery before they use it and things like that. So um, it is something that can be quite hard to deal with um, for people. Uh, and it is something that needs to be, all of these side effects, if, if they're becoming to the point where they're impacting your quality of life, please speak to your team because they can decrease doses and change things around and things like that so that they're not impacting your life so much that it's all you can do is to think about them. So I asked some of my, um, one of my Facebook groups with our patients and family members and carers and whanau in it. And I said, okay, what do you do? So these are some of their tips and tricks. Now I cannot say that every single one of them is medically endorsed. And um, having spoken to a bunch of GPs the other day, they, they will highly recommend that. But they're things that you can try. Um, one of the things they all said was take the medications. If you've got pain relief and you're in pain, take it. If you've got nausea um, and you've got anti-nausea tablets, take them and use them and use those anti-nausea tablets regularly so that it actually prevents the nausea. Taking them once you've got it can be a little bit kind of, um, by the time they start working, it might be too late for you to be kind of enjoying a meal and things like that. Um, rest if you need to rest. Um, 
One thing they found really, really helpful for some of the neuropathy in hands and feet was actually um, Voltaren, you know, like that Voltaren Emudel that you can get from the chemist and you just pop it on your hands and feet if that's where you've got your, the neuropathy. Again, um, not all of these are medically endorsed. Some of them are um, common sense uh, and some of them are much easier said than done. And I think the other thing that they kept coming back to was talk to your team. Um, if you're having side effects, talk to people. Let them know what's actually going on for you. Um, and sometimes some of the side effects aren't necessarily physical as well. Sometimes they can be, um, you know, you might become more emotional or your mood is down uh, and things like that. And so those kind of things need to be taken into consideration as well. It's not just the physical symptoms we need to be kind of letting people know about. It's anything that's not usual for you that you're kind of noticing as you're going through treatment. So the targeted therapies, uh, the immune therapies, these are specific um, therapies that are fairly, I'd like to say new, but the most of them have been around for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years now. So they're not quite so new anymore. Um, and they're designed to kind of either with the immune ones, they're there to kind of get your immune system into overdrive almost so that they recognize the cancer cells and actually kill them. The targeted ones are for specific genes and proteins, and it will depend on what sort of mutations um, as to which one may be um, advised. Um, they can be used on their own or in conjunction with some of the other funded um, medications. The one thing to keep in mind about targeted therapies and immune therapies for bowel cancer is that they are not funded in New Zealand currently. Some of these drugs are funded for other cancers. For example, Keytruda um, works really well with um, metastatic stage four bowel cancer um, for some patients, depending on their mutations. Um, it is funded for lung and it is funded for melanoma, some skin cancers, but it's not funded in New Zealand for bowel cancer. And there's some others uh, as well. So the ones that um, are the most common, I suppose, in New Zealand are the Avastin, Cetuximab and Keytruda. And then there's a couple of others um, that are used less commonly within New Zealand. Now they are available, but there is a cost. And while all three of the most common ones, the Avastin, Cetuximab and Keytruda do have what they call a cost share um, or a cost cap, where once you get to X number of dollars that you've spent on the medication, the medication becomes free, quote unquote. However, the administration in the private clinics continues. It's one thing to keep in mind if you're looking at um, targeted and immune therapies that even though, you know, you might get to your level, which let's just say, for example, is $60,000 you paid for the medication, you'll still need to continue to pay for that ongoing administration of that medication within a private clinic. So it's worth keeping in mind. So all the whirly gigs and, and the new and the upcoming and all the, all the smiley things that are happening within this space. So there has been this recent change to the screening program um, with a lowering of the age that's currently available in Waikato, uh, Te Rafiti and Mid Central um, with hopefully they do say that the rest of New Zealand within the next 12 months. We'll wait and see. Um, and there has been a pledge that the age for the general population will also be lowered. Um, that will be much more incremental. Um, and there's certainly been a lot of media attention. Um, and maybe it's just because I work in this space that I've noticed it. Um, you know, uh, it's one of those things, isn't it, that, you know, once you've bought a certain thing, you kind of see it all the time and maybe that that's what it is. But there is more attention on bowel cancer now and the fact that it is our second major 
cancer killer in New Zealand, second only to lung. So, you know, it is getting out there. So there's a lot of research going into gut microbiomes. So that's all the flora and fauna that goes on within your bowel, looking at um, the flora and fauna within a healthy bowel and those within a bowel cancer bowel, just to see what the differences are. You know, what does a healthy gut look like as opposed to a not healthy gut? And how can we kind of balance those out? Um, there's some beautiful canine sniffer dogs down in um, Dunedin who are being taught to detect certain um, bowel cancer markers within urine samples. Um, I don't know if you've heard stories of sometimes people who own dogs, they, you know, they, they will sometimes say to you the first way I realized something was wrong was that my dog started behaving differently around me because, you know, dogs are pretty, pretty good like that. They can pick up stuff that we often can't. So these sniffer dogs are doing an amazing job um, learning how to do that. And it may just be another tool in the arsenal for, you know, kind of detecting um, bowel cancer. Um, there's also kind of work being done within the circulating tumour DNA to try and find a blood test that will actually be able to let you know with a little bit more accuracy um, whether or not you've actually got bowel cancer. So it is, cut the, the, it is coming um, while they look at kind of the genetics and things like that. Um, and then very soon, I was, we're hoping very soon, um, because there aren't kits available for those who sit outside of the bowel screening age at the moment. Um, these stopped for a myriad of reasons um, being sold. Um, our charity has worked really hard with a local laboratory and with a company to combine their powers, um, a little bit like the Power Rangers, so that we can have an advanced test um, that will soon be launched in New Zealand. Um, and that test, instead of picking up blood in the stool, like the um, National Screening Program, actually picks up specific DNA markers within the sample. So it's going to be much more reliable. Um, and believe me, when it comes, when it's finally available, you will hear me screaming from the rooftops. So you probably Probably will hear one way and another when that is actually um, available for purchase. Um, we're, so it we're sounds paying. like a, um, a, a quantum step change rather than a, a, a small one. Yeah, that, yeah, it will be. Yeah. I mean, the the end goal for this particular kit is that it becomes the the norm for the national screening program. Um, because it will wow. be much more reliable. It will actually tell you that there's, you know, kind of uh, cancer cells there. Um, and so it will possibly take out some of that, uh, the colonoscopies where um, it's picking up hemorrhoids or polyps or something. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. But believe right. me, there, I will sing from the rooftops when, that, <laughs> when it's there. Well, do you think that will find more you know because there's, there's there's always a, a risk of these um you know screening studies and so forth um ending up as they get better um of course we find more because i think you know as you're describing earlier on there's there's a huge amount of people dying from it and i'm i'm can only kind of guess that that's as a result of the fact that it's not being picked up until really late and so therefore it's causing um you know people to pass on but, but would i be right there yeah so do you think yeah that, uh, yeah sorry unfor unfortunately that that probably is the case that it is being picked up way too late um you know particularly for our our younger um, what's called the early onset colorectal cancers, um, they're often uh, found, you know, kind of in ED um, in those emergency situations where it's already, um, you know, quite an advanced tumour. Um, and, yeah, I just, I think it's one of those things that because it is often found late, your chances of kind of surviving it are much less. And I suppose with an advanced being able to actually pick up whether it's um, cancer cells that are within the stool sample, 
um, or just, or I don't mean that to sound quite like it did, and I do apologise, um, instead of blood, what it will stop is some of perhaps the lesser needed colonoscopy. So in a way, it will make things better. Yeah. And that we're more likely doing a colonoscopy because there is something there that is giving off cancer cells um, rather than something benign, but which unfortunately is bleeding at the moment. Yeah. So your screening, your screening capability goes up which will find more people, which will ultimately help more people survive. Yes. Uh, and therefore the, the, the downstream colonoscopies and other kind of testing may fall away because you, you've already discovered it's not in their DNA or there's no cancer cells there. You've, That's that, correct. That must, help, um, yeah. that must help the medical system then, surely. <laughs> that is the theory. Um, right. However, you know, I think internationally a lot of health systems are in various states of disrepair. Um, and so sometimes being the ambulance at the top of the cliff and pe catching people early um, doesn't seem to happen as much as trying to pick up the pieces when people have already fallen. Um, right. You know, it's it's one of those one of those things. But technology is we're getting better. Yeah. Which is terrific, right? I, I think that's yeah. really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um so some of our questions and I will I'll duck through these just because I think some of them <laughs> we've kind of already answered <laughs> as we've gone along. Um so we've gone through the age criteria and uh, the eligibility eligibility for the screening. So as long as you've got a GP or health provider or haohora or within New Zealand, you're within that age criteria, um, you will be sent a kit every two years. Um, if you lose it, if you can't find it, if it goes missing, if you've moved between one and the next, um, you can always give time to screen a call. Um, if you've got your pens and paper there, time to screen you can find them at either timetoscreen.nz uh, or 0800 924 432 and they can help you out with all of that. Um, really quickly, uh, generally speaking, a negative fit will mean, it only means that there was no blood found in your stool on the day that you sent the test in to be checked. So, what it means is that nothing was picked up from the sample you sent in. That doesn't mean that you don't have bowel cancer or you don't have polyps. It just means they weren't bleeding uh, a few days prior to or the day that you did your test. So if you have ongoing issues, even though you've had a negative screening test, you should still see your GP to get those issues looked at. That's not to put the fear of anything into you. That's just to let you know that um, the fits are restricted and they're only looking for the blood within the sample. A positive fit doesn't necessarily mean you have bowel cancer. That blood could be coming from a number of different places. It could be coming from further up the um, the system from kind of your stomach down. So if you've got an ulcer or something in your stomach, which may lead to old blood in your stool sample, that could be picked up. So it doesn't necessarily mean you've got bowel cancer. It just means that blood's been picked up um, when you sent that sample in. Any symptoms, any family history, anything that you're concerned about as far as your bowel health goes, talk to your GP in the first instance. If you feel like you're not being heard or that you, um, you know, these are ongoing and it's not being looked into, either see another GP within the same practice um, and get them to have a look and, and kind of go through things. Or you can even ask that you be referred on further um, to, you know, like a GI specialist or something like that. 
We've already answered about blood tests uh, and things like that. We'll get on to support very, very soon. Um, how do you support a loved one? My short answer would be ask them. Um, my slightly longer answer to that is sometimes and any of you who have been through treatment or who have been through surgery for anything will know that sometimes post that you actually don't have the brain space to be able to ask answer somebody who asks what can I do for you and so sometimes you know um, if you're in a good space uh, writing out a list of all of the chores that you would normally do washing gardening lawns walking the dog picking the kids up picking the grandkids up um going to the movies uh you know going and playing a round of golf write all of that kind of stuff down and then you know if somebody says to you what can i do you can show them the list and go please just pick one and it kind of takes some of that stress off or if you have a wife a husband a son a daughter um you know someone close to you that's actually going through it write down the kind of stuff that you know you know that they need done and then again you know when people ask you've got it to hand immediately it can be really helpful and take that stress away from I just I'm fine don't ask I'm everything's good because you actually don't have the brain space to be able to kind of work it out what it is that you need that's that's really good advice uh, I found that um and others may experience this as well, please comment, that when you're in that situation and, and someone offers to help, they say, give me a call if you need anything. But we don't. And, and because we're too afraid to put the burden on someone. And so we end up um, <laughs> people very generously offering. We don't really respond. So having a list is, is fantastic. I think because there is a cancer fatigue, there's certainly a fatigue with the whole thing, along with the yeah. stress of, of what's happening. Yeah. Um, so, so great idea, and and we want to be, um, you know, passing on to our our men as well. Yeah, and I think the other thing is, if you're going to do something for someone, sometimes it does pay to check, maybe. Um, you know, it's all, it, I think it's amazing that people want to do food and meals, but I've only got a really, really small freezer. So if I had 20 meals turn up all at once, I don't have the space to to house that many. Um, and so sometimes just checking, look, I'm, I'm cooking dinner, I'm doing a really big lasagna, shall I drop it round for you? And people can either say yes or no. Um, is actually quite good as well. So it's it's little things like that sometimes. We all want to be so incredibly helpful. But like I say, sometimes all of it all at once can can be a, a, a bit overwhelming. And cancer's right. not a short sprint, generally speaking. Um, it's quite a long marathon. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, you might have meals for the first six weeks and then nothing. Um, and you, yep. you're still having treatment, you know, months later. So, I have a question about <clears throat> nutrition, Victoria. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any way we can get, um, I guess, access or support in helping us with perhaps, <clears throat> I don't know, at one stage, perhaps in my case, post surgery diet? <clears throat> uh, yes. <laughs> Um, I, the only reason I say a little bit of hesitation in that is that um, there's a couple of ways to get that kind of support. One is via the hospital and the hospital dietitians. Um, they, there's also community dietitians which your GP can refer you for. Um, and just a plug for ourselves, on our website, we have a resource called Eating Well During Treatment, um, and it covers that kind of the whole treatment thing, so including post-treatment. Um, mm -hmm. It was written in conjunction with uh, Kate Ellison, who's actually had bowel cancer herself. Uh, so she knows, she's been there. She knows, you know, kind of what it's like. Um, so that's available on our website. You can either download it or we can send you out a hard copy. Um, mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that, you know, diet post 
bowel cancer can be quite challenging. Um, bowels hate to be messed with and they can take a long, long, long time to develop any sort of normal, any sort of normal again. Um, and even after years, there will still be a day where everything just goes haywire and you can't put your finger on why or what you've eaten. Um, you know, you just have a bad day with it. So there are ways that you can get some really good diet and nutrition advice um, during treatment, post-treatment, and kind of as that longer journey goes on as well. Okay, thank you. No problem. Victoria, we did have a question come in um, pre coming online, which was regard yes. to the, the flu injection. Yes. Um, so as far as getting things like flu vaccines or any sort of vaccine, actually, uh, first place to start is with your medical team at the hospital. Um, the specific question had to do with kind of being, you know, a couple of months post treatment and then waiting for those next steps and not quite sure what that next step might look like. Um, Always the best place to start is to ask the team that you're under, whether that's oncology, radiation oncology, whether that's surgical, whatever that looks like, to check first, because they will have your long-term plan um, better than anyone else. And they'll be able to say to you, yeah, yep, yeah, no, fine, go and have your flu shot now. Um, if you've come to the end of treatment and you know, there, you know, you're just on a like a follow-up scheme now um, then getting flu shots and things like that shouldn't cause any issues again it's probably worth just running it past your gp before you go and have that done and particularly with any of the other um immunizations that might be out there i know that there's the one for um shingles and things like that so any mm -hmm. any time that you're looking at any of those vaccinations just have a quick chat with either your gp or your medical team Thanks for that. That was me, that question. Oh, cool. Cool. Um, yeah. Hope, yeah, just that's one of those things, you know, always just check quickly because it could be if yeah. there is going to be any sort of follow up treatment that your team will know when that's going to happen. Um, and the last well, thing you want yeah. is the flu injection and then be called into surgery, you know, a yeah. few days later. Well, we just had, I've had um, six weeks of radiation for every day and um chemo as well that all stopped in december but i'm going along the process now oh and it killed a um 10 centimeter by seven centimeter tumor wow. and yeah and wow. it's now got um i've got three spots but i'm waiting for another month because they say the radiation could still be working within my system because I had so much of it. Yeah. Yes. So that was my thing about the is it wise to get the, you know, the flu injection, really? Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, have a have a chat with okay. um probably your oncology team or your surgical team. Um and just say, look, I'd like to have the flu shot. They'll probably say, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But it's always a good idea just to check with any of those kinds okay. of things first. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, no worries. Now, because we're kind of woo, getting to the wards the end of time, I'm just going to quickly, because, <laughs> because this is my job, this is what I do. So Bowel Cancer New Zealand is a charity. We are separate from the screening program. Um, and we are there as a voice for patients in whānau throughout New Zealand um, to raise the profile of bowel cancer. Um, you know, our ultimate goal is a New Zealand free of bowel cancer and how cool would that, would that be? Um, so just quickly to let you know, this is the sort of services that we have available for patients and family members. Um, we've got physiotherapy that we fund, uh, as well as counselling for patient and their immediate uh, whānau member. So that could be, um, you know, anyone who's the main carer 
for someone. Um, we also have one-off vouchers for either petrol or groceries, which we are able to send out to people. Uh, there's online support. Um, I run a couple of webinars a year, just some of them are panels, some of them are specific information for bowel cancer patients. Um, really quite interesting kind of stuff that we get there and there's a huge array of resources on our website anything from like I say our eating well booklet right the way through to fact sheets on how you can raise funds for targeted therapies if that's what you're doing um, we also have some of our um, brochures and different translations so that you know some of those important ones are there and can be read in a language that's somebody's first language so it's just because I like pictures and I hadn't had one for a while. Um, but yeah, so those are the kind of things that we're involved with. We're involved very much within that support. Support for patients of Varnell is always going to be our main cornerstone. Um, we work in the areas of education, for example, sessions like this, which I also run um, like I say, I did one for GPs, uh, I did one for health professionals that work within the corrections um, department, um, I've done them for corporates uh, and all sorts of other things. Um, we attend GP conferences and things like that to raise awareness, to let people know that, you know, the narrative around bowel cancer is changing and that we actually are there for patients and families and we want them to be well supported. So this is our team. Um, this is us, the nationwide team for bowel cancer New Zealand. Um, we like to say we're a small team with a very big heart. Um, and that's, you know, we, we work quite hard within this space to um, make sure that people are heard. And for anyone who wants to get hold of me, if I haven't answered questions, um, if you think of something in a day or two, if there's any sort of support that you that you would like, um, that you think that we might be able to help you out with, this is how you can get hold of me. I do only work part time. Um, and if you forget everything else and you need information or you're looking for information or you want to find me, uh, just head to our website, which is Balkan cancernz.org.nz you'll find all of my contact details as well as um, up-to-date relevant information for Aotearoa in New Zealand so thank you um, I'm sorry I rushed through those last few but I think the answering the questions was way more important than kind of getting through the rest of my slides so I'm thank you gonna... Victoria yeah thank you, right. um, thank you. Fascinating, really, really uh, interesting what you do. And I'm sure that everyone um, learned something tonight, which is the purpose of why we have these classes and uh, so that there's, there's value out there. And I hope everyone has enjoyed themselves. We thank you so much for choosing us uh, tonight to spend some time with us. But a, a big thank you to you, Victoria. Um, what you do is really, really valuable for many, many people and your team uh, for people around the country with bowel cancer and certainly massive numbers um, of us being affected by that. So we wish you all the best and we thank you so much for providing uh, this presentation for us tonight.